President Ma, I'd like to present to you briefly our four panelists who I've already uh, introduced at greater length. Our panel chair is Dr. William Perry, Professor Emeritus at Stanford and former Secretary of Defense. Our panelists are Dr. Thomas Finger, the Oxenberg Rowan Distinguished Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute, Ambassador Carl Eikenberry, the William J. Perry Fellow in International Security here at CSAC and FSI, and Dr. Lan He Chen, David and Diane Steffi Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution. And now it's my pleasure to turn over this event to my dear friend and colleague, someone I have immense personal admiration for, Dr. William Perry, who will introduce President Ma. Thank you, Larry. President Ma Ying-jo was elected president in January of 2008 with 58% of the vote. Now, in the United States, if a president is elected by 58%, it's called a landslide. <laughs> in fact, for 58%, almost any presidential candidate would give up his firstborn to get 58%. <laughs> and at the time, the relations with the mainland were very tense. And President Mark campaigned on a promise to improve those relations. And that's a case, campaign promise which he kept. I had a personal observation of that. Just two months after he was elected, I led a delegation to visit first Taipei and then Beijing. And while there, we proposed the best way of dealing, of ameliorating the soft detention was to improve air travel, increase air travel. And indeed, <laughs> President Amar acted forcefully in the US. In a few months, again, between Taiwan and the mainland, and now just the thousands of flights. Made an immense difference. It made a difference to the economy. I was doing much travel between the mainland and Taiwan. Much tourism, which, among other things, creates good feelings and many family trip visits. So it's been, in my mind, an immense improvement situation. I think more than anything has led to far better relationships so that today we do not consider, and I don't think Taiwan considers either, the possibility of the military conflict with China to be high on the list of things to worry about. That's a big difference from 2008, and President Ma gets a lot of credit for that. The basic idea of increasing is to replace mass with mutual assured destruction with MAED, mutual assured economic destruction. That is, each side is so deeply involved in economic exercise that a military conflict would have been almost unthinkable. <clears throat> now, President Ma was re-elected in 2012 and has one year to go in his term of office. And he, so it's worth looking back at the legacy he will leave. He'll certainly leave a, a legacy of, of an improved economy. He diversified the economy. He, he created a new growth engine the company. And most importantly, perhaps, he established the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement between Taiwan and the mainland. So the economic legacy is, is deep and profound. Secondly, there's a security. The difference in security between now and seven years ago is very great. Some of that, of course, stemmed from the improved economy. And then finally, he's given serious attention to improving the environment, both by reducing energy consumption and by leading to a substantial carbon reduction, setting a model which other nations of the world might well follow. So President Ma, you have a year to go, but you already have left a very profound legacy behind you. And I'd like to turn it over to Floor with you now to give us your remarks. Thank you, Secretary Perry. Let me also introduce uh, the uh, uh, friends on our side. First of all, the uh, uh, Secretary General to the President, Mr. Deng Yongquan, 
Secretary General of the National Security Council, Cao Hua Zhu. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lin Yongle General. Thank you. Now let me uh, start my uh, address. Secretary Perry, Professor Diamond, Dr. Fingar, Ambassador Eikenberry, Dr. Chen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm very happy to be here for today's video conference jointly sponsored by the Presidential Office of the Republic of China and Stanford University to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the ROC's victory in the resistance war against Japan. This gives us an opportunity to discuss the historical significance of World War II and the ROC's resistance war with some of America's most distinguished scholars. We will also take a look at current developments in U.S. ROC relations and cross-strait relations. Back in April of 2013, the ROC and Stanford held a video conference with many well-known scholars. It was moderated by former U.S. Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice. That video conference was a resounding success, so we are very pleased to cooperate with Stanford University again and trust that we will recreate that success here today. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, as well as the ROC's victory in the resistance war against Japan. In July 1937, two years before World War II broke out, ROC forces began fighting against Japanese aggression alone. <coughs> And for four long years, they continued with virtually no outside help. It wasn't until the Pearl Harbor attack in December 1941 that the ROC joined forces with the Allies to declare war against Japan, Germany, and Italy. The ROC's resistance war continued for eight years, making it the longest war against foreign aggression in our history. It involved more citizens than any other conflict and required the most horrifying sacrifices. Over 3 million military personnel and 20 million citizens lost their lives or seriously injured. 268 generals died in combat. It also had a more lasting impact than any other war in our history. In his 2000 14 book, Forgotten Ally, China's World War II, 1937 to 1945. Oxford University professor Rana Meter tells the story of the ROC's heroic resistance against Japan. Using outdated weapons against massive odds, ROC forces engaged in a war of resistance to the end that broke no surrender and no compromise. Without outside assistance, ROC forces tied down 800,000 fully modernized, well-trained Japanese troops, which allowed Allied forces to make counterattacks in both the European and Asian theaters at the same time, and ultimately prevail. Professor Meter believes that this was China's great contribution to the Allied powers in World War II. The United States proved to be a staunch friend. The most notable example of that friendship was the American Volunteer Group, AVG, organized in 1941, even before the Pearl Harbor attack. A group that became legendary by their nickname, the Flying Tigers. Before they had been in China for a whole year, the Flying Tigers had shot down nearly 300 Japanese aircraft led by Commander Claire Chinot. Thus, they thus allow the ROC's severely crippled Air Force 
to gradually regain its fighting capabilities. So history tells very clearly and concretely when the ROC really needed it, the US was always there to extend a helping hand. The Land Lease Act of 1941 and the war materials supplied under the act are another good example of American friendliness and generosity. That kind of timely assistance and genuine friendship are quite touching and inspiring. This year, the ROC government will be holding a series of events to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the resistance war against Japan. And we will be inviting the family of President Roosevelt's grandson, granddaughter of General Claire Chenault, the leader of the Flying Tigers, and descendants of General Jimmy Doolittle, leader of the Doolittle Air Raid on Tokyo in April 1942, five months after Pearl Harbor. The grandson of General Whitmire, Chief of Staff of the China Theater during 1944 to 46, and granddaughter of missionary Minnie Voucher, who was acting dean of the Jinling Girls College and nicknamed American Goddess at the rape of Nanking in 1937. We helped, who helped save the lives of 10,000 Chinese citizens, mostly women, to participate in those events. We will then have a chance to thank them in person for the tremendous contribution that their forebearers made to the Republic of China and its people, no matter how long that historic event has passed. During the Cold War period, following World War II, the friendship between the ROC and the US flourished. As the, as the US continued to help us militarily while providing economic assistance. Between 1950 and 1965, that assistance included 1.5 billion US dollars in economic aid, which is probably worth at least 12 billion now. The US president for much of that era, Dwight Eisenhower, also made a series of key decisions that had a telling effect on peace in the Taiwan Strait. He signed the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty of 1954, which made the ROC and US military allies again. It was also President Eisenhower who continued to dispatch the 7th Fleet to patrol the Taiwan Strait, pursuant to the Formosa Resolution passed by Congress in 1955. During the 1958 Taiwan Strait crisis, President Eisenhower dispatched US naval personnel to provide logistics and convoy for ROC forces stationed in Jinmen and Matu, the two offshore islands less than three kilometers from the Chinese mainland. President Eisenhower personally visited the ROC in June 1960, shortly before his second term expired, and issued a joint communique with President Chiang Kai-shek. That communique affirmed that under the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty, both parties oppose any provocation involving Taiwan, Penghu, Kinmen, and Matu. And that affirmation became the foundation for the ROC's stable development and peace in the Taiwan Strait for the next two decades. Although the ROC and US severed diplomatic ties in 1979, barely three months later, the U.S. Congress passed the Taiwan Relations Act, the TRA. Under that act, Taiwan is treated as a foreign government for purposes of U.S. law and the U.S. courts. The act also requires the U.S. to provide Taiwan with defensive weapons. I remember at that time, one U.S. scholar, Carl Gable, commented on American change in diplomatic direction. He said that when President Carter established formal diplomatic relations with mainland China and cut ties with Taiwan. That amounted to the recognition of Taiwan by the executive branch. But then the Taiwan Relations Act was enacted by Congress, which kept intact all but formal diplomatic ties with the ROC, amounted to legislative re-recognition of Taiwan. At that time, I was studying law at Harvard 
one day I came across Professor Stefan Max, supervisor of my doctoral thesis, in the hallway of the library. He said to me, Injo, I understand how you felt these days, but I want you to know that Taiwan is the most recognized, unrecognized government of the United States. What happened in the following 36 years is exactly like what Professor Vox said. Since I came into office in 2008, mutual ROC US trust has been restored at the highest level of government. And over the past two years, they have been frequent reciprocal visits by high level officials. In April of last year, the US Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Gina McCarthy visited Taiwan and Charles Rifkin, Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs, is visiting Taiwan now. At the same time, heads of various ROC government agencies have visited the US. So there is a solid foundation of mutual trust there. For many years, the US government has faithfully fulfilled the provisions of the Taiwan Relations Act, as well as the six assurances associated with the communique of August 17, 1982. And in the seven years since I took office, US arms sales to Taiwan have reached 18.3 billion US dollars. That is the highest total in the past 20 years and twice what was sold during the previous administration. And the ROC is also gaining more support in Congress. Just before, just last month, during deliberations on the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2016, the House and Senate Armed, Force, Armed Services Committee both passed initiatives that call for increased US ROC military exchanges. Those initiatives include inviting the ROC to participate in the rim of the Pacific exercise, RIMPAC, and red flag training exercises, clearly upgrading bilateral Taiwan-US security cooperation. In addition to strong security ties, Taiwan-US trade relations have also made significant progress. Over the last few years, in March of 2013, after a five-year hiatus, we reopened negotiations with the U.S. under the Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, TIFA, a platform set up in 1994 to facilitate talks in trade and investment matters. We have continued bilateral consultations in a series of 12 work conferences and have made significant progress. As of the end of this March, the ROC is America's 10th larger trading partner, surpassing Brazil and Saudi Arabia. And the US is Taiwan's third largest after mainland China and Japan. Meanwhile, the US decision to let Taiwan join the visa waiver program in November 2012 proves to be a right and popular move. Out of the 38 countries that have search status, Taiwan is the only one that does not have formal diplomatic ties with the US. The number of Taiwan visitors to the U.S. rose about 20%. They not only admire your history and your way of life, they are also serious shoppers. They contribute a lot to narrow the trade deficit you have with Taiwan. So all these things add up, increased trust at the highest levels, and closer political, economic, and security cooperation show that over the last seven years, Taiwan US ties are the best they have been in the 36 years since the Taiwan Relations Act was passed. Successive US Secretaries of State, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, have both publicly affirmed that Taiwan is an important security and economic partner of the United States. And that is pretty good summation of the current state of bilateral Taiwan US relations. Let me now turn to cross-strait relations. Since I was elected in 2008, I have been firmly committed under the framework of the ROC Constitution to maintaining the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. In this context, the term status quo means no unification, no independence, and no use of force. 
I have also remained committed based on the 1992 consensus, which is one China respective interpretations to promoting cross-strait peace and development. These policies have completely transformed the Taiwan Strait so that so what was once a flashpoint for a country, now a heaven of peace. Over the past seven years, Taiwan and mainland China have signed 21 agreements. During the same period, visitors from mainland China have made over 14 million trips to Taiwan, almost 4 million of them in the past year alone. So the cross strait situation is more stable and peaceful than it has ever been in the past 66 years. Progress toward peace and stability in cross strait relations over the past seven years has had a significant peace dividend. The vicious cycle of cross strait and foreign relations of the past has become a virtuous cycle. So countries from all over the world have been able to freely interact with both sides of the Taiwan Strait at the same time under the One China Respective Interpretation Concept and unprecedented development. In April last year, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, Daniel Russell, said in Congress that as a general matter, we very much welcome and applaud the extraordinary progress that has occurred in cross-strait relations and the Ma administration. In February this year, he also said that development in Taiwan-U.S. relations over the past few years have been very constructive, and that progress in cross-strait relations had a lot to do with that. U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, Susan Thrunton, also stressed recently that unofficial Taiwan-U.S. relations have never been better. She noted that over the past few years, the stable handling of trust trade relations has been an important factor in the close cooperation that now characterizes Taiwan-U.S. relations. She went on to say that the benefits that stable trust relations ties have brought to both sides of the Taiwan Strait, the United States and the region have been enormous. It is important that both sides of the Taiwan Strait understand the importance of this benefit and work to establish a basis for continued peace and stability. Maintaining close communication and a no surprise, no, a low key approach has allowed all parties to demonstrate restraint and flexibility. We want to see this approach continue. So this marks the first time since the beginning of the Cold War that the U.S. need not choose sides in cross-strait like, cross equation. And many China and Taiwan need not face this predicament either. This is how the very foundation of the status quo in Taiwan-U.S. relations. In addition to seeking stable development in cross-strait and ROC-U.S. relations, Taiwan has also taken concrete actions over the past few years to be a regional peacemaker in both the East China Sea and the South China Sea. Back in August of 2012, I proposed the East China Sea Peace Initiative. That initiative asked stakeholders to forego conflict in favor of peaceful negotiations and emphasize cooperation in sharing resources. Eight months later in April of 2013, Taiwan and Japan signed a fisheries agreement that embodies the spirit of that initiative and solved a fisheries dispute between Taiwan and Japan that has troubled both countries for 40 years. That agreement elicited widespread praise and support from the global community. Secretary of State John Kerry has publicly stated that the ROC Japan Fisheries Agreement is a model for promoting regional stability and that the principle at the heart of the East China Sea Peace Initiative apply to all the waters in Asia. In the East China Sea, the East China Sea Peace Initiative, Initiative encourages stakeholders to share their dispute and cooperate to create win-win situations. Its success makes it a model for peaceful development in the South China Sea.
So on the 26th of last month, I formally announced the South China Sea Peace Initiative, hoping that the relevant parties will shelve sovereignty disputes, pursue peace and reciprocity, and promote joint exploration and development. By upholding those principles, we hope that all the parties involved will work together to maintain regional peace and promote regional development. Immediately, a U.S. State Department official stated that the U.S. appreciated the proposal in South Asia Peace Initiative. I sincerely hope that all the outstanding scholars and experts gathered here will support the pursuit of peace that I have presented today. So today, as we commemorate the 70th anniversary of the ROC's victory in the resistance war against Japan and end of World War II, I hope we can put aside the trials and tribulations of the past and look forward to a brighter future. The people and government of the ROC cherish our hard-won peace and prosperity and hope that all countries can turn the painful lessons of history into a force of regional peace and prosperity. Inspired by all successes in promoting prostrate and regional peace, we also appeal to countries all over the world to resolve disputes through peaceful means and work together as we seek sustainable peace and prosperity for all of humankind. In short, we commemorate the victory of World War II to prevent future wars. Another observation, another observation I want to make is that both Washington and Taipei agree that the current Taiwan-U.S. relations is and is best in 36 years. What are the key reasons for that? In my view, there are two key reasons beyond strong traditional friendship built since World War II. First of all, the successful handling of cross relations based on the 1992 consensus, namely one China, respective interpretations. Second, the low-key and surprise-free approach to the conduct of our bilateral relations. The first one even, is even more critical than the second one. That is to say, without the 1992 consensus, I doubt the current status quo can be maintained. I hope this invaluable model will continue well into the future, even after I step down as President of the Republic of China. Today's program will now continue with a two-way video conference, so please do submit your questions. I trust that today's program will be a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Ma, for your profound and thoughtful comments. We're now going to go into the Q&A session, starting off with Tom Finger. Tom? Uh, President Ma, thank you very much for agreeing to this televised exchange for the points that you made in your speech. I will echo what uh, Dr. Perry says. It's many, many excellent uh, points. I would like to pick up on one of the points in the latter part of your address, namely your proposal last week for a peace initiative in the South China Sea, that I certainly think this is a, a very sensible approach. And I have two questions about it, if you could elaborate. The, the first is, in the spirit of close communication and no surprises, was your proposal shared with Beijing and with the other claimant states before you made it? Did they help in formulating it? And secondly, how will you work to advance this proposal now that you have put it out there for others to, to react to? How will you use the influence that you have, the example that is set in the East China Sea to persuade others to sign on to your proposal? Mm -hmm. Well, these are very uh, good questions. First of all, before we propose the South China Sea Peace Initiative, obviously we will let our friends uh, know in advance what we will be doing. This is a very important step 
hoping that it will achieve the similar result as we did in the East China Sea Peace Initiative. Well, you raise an interesting question. In addition to the broad and general ideas of uh, peace, of uh, the um, uh, lower down the tension and uh, stop the escalation of uh, unilateral action, we also, we also have a roadmap which we'll announce in the near future. As the case in East China Sea Peace Initiative, we certainly have a, as I said, broad and general plans. But in, within a month, we came up with a roadmap. We hope we will have three sets of bilateral talks between Japan, mainland China, mainland China and Taiwan, and Taiwan and Japan. If we can come up with concrete results after the three sets of bilateral talks, then we may be able to enter, enter into a one set trilateral negotiation. So far, many in China and Japan already have fisher agreements and agreements on the exploration of hydrocarbon resources. We don't have any agreement with many in China now, but we did have one as I mentioned in my address uh, in 2013, we concluded the Taiwan-Japan Fisheries Agreement, which effectively dealt with the uh, fishery dispute in the last 40 years. So the agreement is uh, uh, working quite well because we set up a uh, permanent uh, commission in order to oversee the operation of the agreement. So every time we have a problem, if we have an incident, we take that to the uh, commission, and uh, usually we can stop over there. So I think we have uh, established a uh, feasible, workable solution in dealing with the regional dispute. The, your question is, can I apply this to South China Sea? I have to admit, South China Sea situation is much more complicated. There are more claims, and the sea area is much longer. And so we need to be more patient. But it is quite clear that the competition of a territorial claim would lead nowhere. The idea is that while national sovereignty cannot be divided or compromised, but natural resources can be shared, this is probably the only way to downsize the problem and trying to find out the solution. Uh, so this is something, well, actually, we tried for a little bit with the Philippines uh, in the last couple of years. We also had a, a series of uh, fisher disputes with the Philippines, which is very much like what we had with Japan. Uh, particularly two years ago, one of our fishermen was shot dead, and his ship uh, seriously damaged as a result of the charge that they are operating in the Filipino exclusive economic zone. But actually, that zone is also claimed by us. So it's an overlapping ADC. Whatever, uh, the fisherman was killed, so we launched protests against the Filipinos, uh, demanding an apology, compensation for the victim family, and, uh, pro and, and uh, prosecuting the, um, uh, uh, the, the Coast Guard persons for uh, shooting with automatic weapons and and concluding agreements with Taiwan on fishery uh, things. Well, in the last uh, two years, we have actually accomplished almost uh, everything. They apologize, they compensate the family of the victim, and they uh, indicted the um, uh, person, the perpetrators, eight of them, for homicide, and we have negotiated not a fisher agreement, but agreement on the mode of uh, uh, enforcement. Enforcement. And there are three key components. First of all, uh, no force, and uh, no force is used, whatever. Secondly, prior notification before enforcement. And number three, uh, if in case of uh, arrest or detention, prompt release should be guaranteed. Actually, in the 
uh, last two years, we did have several incidents, but all this consensus applied. So we are we we have been able to solve those disputes, uh, no matter than a week. In some cases, only a few hours. In case of violation of the law, the fisherman may be fined, but after they pay the fine and they're released. So we try to reduce the number of uh, disputes, and we try to shorten the distance that it will take, uh, the, the time it will take to uh, resolve this dispute. So that's what, what we mean, that we, we try to uh, uh, settle the disputes with a peaceful means. And we hope similar arrangement could be also made to other parts of South China Sea. But as I said, South China Sea is um, much bigger and uh, more complicated. But what else can you expect? If we don't do this, we certainly will see a uh, very serious situation coming up in the future. Thank you. Question from Dr. Chen. Thank you, Professor. And thank you, Mr. President, for your time. Thank you for appearing with us by video at Stanford. We welcome you to Stanford, and thank you for your eloquent uh, and insightful remarks. I want to ask you a question about a topic that is of mutual interest to our, uh, to our two societies, and that's the topic of trade. Uh, one of the things that the United States and the Republic of China share is a desire for a safer and more prosperous world. Key to creating a more prosperous world is a regime of trade liberalization. Here in the United States, we've been engaged in a huge discussion and debate over something which you are very familiar with, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. This has been a priority for your administration. It's been a priority for the Republic of China over the last several years, and I hope will be a priority for years to come. So what I'd like to know from you, Mr. President, is what you intend to do in your last months in office to advance the ball as Taiwan seeks participation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and how you intend to ensure that future administrations will also carry the banner of the value of trade liberalization, not just for the Republic of China, but for societies in the region as well. Well, thank you for that very uh, good question. Actually, ever since last year, we have lined up all the departments in our government to prepare for our uh, participation in TPP. TPP now involves 12 countries, all our trading partners. Together, the trade uh, account to 35% of our total bilateral trade. That means 200 billion US dollars a year. So this is vitally important to us because our GDP growth, about 70% depends on our bilateral trade. We understand it's difficult to join because none of the 12 uh, potential members of TPP are our diplomatic allies. We don't have diplomatic relations with them. That makes our participation difficult. But on the other hand, trade knows no boundaries. And so we continue to express our strong interest to do that. Thanks to the American government, which has uh, uh, many times expressed their appreciation of our interest in joining the T TPP. And that is why we watch attentively what happened in your Congress. We are very happy that the TPP actually passed Senate, and now it's in the House. We hope that also passed, so we have a chance to join the multilateral negotiations uh, of the TPP. Certainly, we have to prepare ourselves for that. We have to further liberalize our trade and deregulate our regulation. As I said, ever since the early, uh, uh, January last year, we have already line up, line up a different department of the government, and we also call back the, uh, our representatives abroad for a consultation to make sure that we understand the need of the potential partners of TPP. We have been advised by the U.S. government that we could use the U.S.-Korea FTA as a model for our participation in TPP. So we are doing that. As, as you know, as is the case in many countries, uh, the process of liberalization is no easy job. So we also uh, appropriate a, a large sum of money 
to cope with that situation for uh, consultations, for, uh, for other financial help to the companies which may uh, incur damages or other losses as a result of further legalization. But for us, for the Republic of China, we have no choice. Actually, as I said, we depend so much on foreign trade, and we have to catch up with our trading partners and competitors. Take Korea, for example. Yesterday, they finally inked the FDA with Men in China, which will take effect uh, probably later this year. Uh, as of now, uh, uh, as of now in Taiwan, only 10% of the goods we export are covered by FTA type of agreement. In the case of Korea, more than 35. And after their uh, deal with Men in China, I'm sure it will go up more than 40%. So we are actually competing with our major competitors, not at an equal footing. We need a more, not only stable, but also fair environment to facilitate our exports, which is our lifeline. So I think you raised a very good question. But in the last two years or so, uh, we do have some domestic problem. For instance, we have signed a trade in services agreement with Men in China two years ago. But the, uh, uh, the agreement is still in our legislative yuan, our national parliament, uh, waiting for approval. Uh, after 20 rounds of uh, public hearing, we still uh, see no progress. And this is uh, uh, certainly a message our trading partners probably do not like to see, because they hope once an agreement is negotiated and completed, they could receive a proper uh, arrangement in their national parliament in order to, for that agreement to become a reality. So this is something we hope uh, we can conquer uh, in the near future in my uh, last year in office. But I also want to say that for our relations with the United States, our joining the TPP is a vital step to promote and to reintegrate the trade and investment relation between our two countries. Thank you. Thank you, President Mahoney. Let me now turn to General Attenberry. Good morning, Mr. President. I feel very privileged to be able to stay in this uh, conversation with you. During your remarks, Mr. President, you have noted that President Eisenhower, in the 1960s, during the Taiwan Strait crisis, dispatched the U.S. Navy to help resupply Matsu and Jinmen. And that reminded me, um, in 1971, as a West Point cadet, I went to Kaohsiung and uh, studied at the National Military Academy, but we also had the Taiwan Air Force to fly us to Jinmen. And Mr. President, there were 100,000 troops on that island. It was a fortress. Now, in two years later, in 2011, the National Security Advisor, I think at that time, arranged for me to go to Jinmen again. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, there weren't so many troops. In fact, I think there were more mainland tourists on the island than there were local population. That's right. I, I think that because of the dramatic changes that have occurred uh, over the history of the Republic of China and Taiwan, international. But still, I know that you as President and Commander-in-Chief have looked very carefully at your strategy, you've looked at the composition of your force, you've looked at the possibility of moving to a volunteer force. I'd be very interested, uh, Mr. President, in what your vision is for your armed forces in the future and for your defense strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, ever since we improved our relations with the mainland, a uh, similar question always come up. How do we deal with our defense? As you know, ever since about 2005, the military balance across Taiwan Strait has been toward the mainland China because they increase their military budget almost uh, 20% every year. So there's no way we could engage the mainland in an arms race. 
So we have to rethink about our defense strategy in order to deter the potential adversary from um, attacking Taiwan. We, I have developed an idea of a three-line defense. The first line of defense is the institutionalization of rapprochement with Spain and China. As you know, before I took office, there were no commercial flights between Taiwan and Miami. Now, it's 120 flights a day. You know, it's, well, together, it's only together 240 a day. And on the other hand, there's more, as you uh, observe, more tourists of men and women than soldiers. So this is a reality. This is a status quo. And neither side want to unilateral change, but particularly for its non-peaceful means. So we try to we try to build a super stable framework so that uh, none of us want to do that in the future. That, that is a unilateral change. The second line of defense is to make Taiwan an asset instead of a liability to the international community. So we try our best to play the role of a responsible stakeholder, a uh, peacemaker, and a provider of, of international humanitarian aid. Uh, as you can see, we try very hard to do that. Not only in many China's earthquake, in Japan's tsunami or nuclear incident, but also in the earthquake in Haiti and the Ebola uh, in West Africa. We try our best to make sure that uh, as long as we, uh, we can afford it, we try to help other countries. So we will continue to play that role. And number three is our military forces. Beginning three years ago, we started an ambitious program to make our armed forces a voluntary one. Now, please watch the way I use. Voluntary, not all voluntary. What does that mean? Well, all voluntary means that uh, there's no conscription at all. We have not gotten rid of conscription for every male, uh, young man. He still has to serve four months of military training in armed forces just to prepare him as a soldier. And then he could uh, retire in the reserve. But one, uh, for, for one thing, this is a requirement of our constitution. If we want to change that, we have to change our constitution first. But that has also an advantage that to make every family that has a uh, male uh, member uh, has something to do with the military. So military will have a broader contact with the society. And on the other hand, we try to uh, downsize our armed forces to make it better, more in quality. Uh, Initially, some people feared that we, have, we might have difficulties to recruit the necessary uh, number of soldiers we need. But last year, it was uh, interesting to note that we asked for uh, 10,500, but there were 3,000 come to, uh, uh, 30, I'm sorry, 30,000 uh, come to report. And that enabled us to uh, pick and choose uh, uh, 15,000. So we are getting more confident on uh, our ability to recruit the needed soldiers to uh, make a uh, uh, voluntary forces. Uh, on the other hand, we still need the weaponry from outside. So we are very grateful for the United States to provide defensive weapons to Taiwan under the Taiwan Relations Act. The, the most urgent need at the moment is uh, diesel engine subs. And that we have been waiting for over, almost, almost uh, 13 years. And so we have decided uh, a couple of years ago to take a two-pronged uh, approach to this question. First of all, we want to do it ourselves with the help from outside. In case we are unable to acquire from a foreign country. So we, it would take us longer, but at least we'll be able to manufacture one in the future. 
certainly we still need uh, advanced weaponry in, uh, to, in order to uh, implement a policy of viable deterrence. So that still requires a very close uh, cooperation with the United States. So far, uh, I'm quite satisfied that in the last seven years, the security cooperation with the United States has never been better before. Uh, this is a very important, not only because we will become a very important part of the uh, rebalancing to Asia strategy of the United States, but also our existence, our efforts to play the role of original peacemaker actually contribute to the peace and stability in this part of the world. So we will work hand in hand with the United States to become a, a important foundation of peace and prosperity in this part of the world. That's our grand strategy. Thank you. Um, I would like to return, Mr. President, to the topic of the status quo. You, you explained um, what it means uh, in part. Uh, I invite you to uh, elaborate, and, and the question is prompted by uh, experience that I had in commentary during what was called the normalization of U.S.-China relations, where it was argued by many that if the relationship wasn't moving forward, it was automatically sliding back. And arguably because of the extent of the changes that have occurred in the cross-strait relationship, the status quo is, is dynamic. It's not static. It's not something that could be frozen for a while. Uh, but it, it needs to continue to move forward. And I wonder if you would comment on that as you think appropriate. Well, uh, actually, the word status quo was first uh, used in the context of social relations seven years ago when I took office. In my inaugural address, I put it very bluntly that we will uh, promote the policy of uh, no unification, no independence, and no use of force under the framework of the Republic of China Constitution and promote cross-trade relations uh, on the uh, One China respective, respective uh, interpretation formula, which is something we call 92 consensus. This, all this element, uh, element constitutes the status quo on which we build today's cross-trade relations. It is very different very different from the status quo of seven years ago. We have actually overhauled the cross-trade relation to a point, to a point that the people on both sides of the power trade actually feel the need to pre preserve the status quo. So in all the opinion polls we've conducted so far in the last seven years, more than 80% of the people support the status quo between Taiwan and Myanmar. And that is why even the uh, presidential candidate of the opposition party also said she wants to support status quo. This is an interesting development because usually opposition leaders will change status quo. But whatever, we think it's very important to have that consensus. And the status quo, no unification, no independence, and no use of force, means that we will not, as I said seven years ago, to engage the mainland in unification talks. That's what I mean by no unification. No independence. We will not support the policy of independence in Taiwan because there's no such need. And uh, you know, I was uh, asked uh, five years ago by Christina Adelport of CNN, why didn't we declare independence? I told her, Christiana, have you ever heard any country in the world that declared independence twice? was that's the obvious based on such need. And uh, on the other hand, it's also more important that we should not allow the use of force in uh, settling the dispute between Taiwan and mainland China. So if we can get, we can keep these three elements, I think we will have this. But I don't know whether everyone is confident that in the future the leaders of Taiwan will do that. Another thing uh, is what I said, the uh, 
on 92 consensus, which is uh, the consensus that the two sides of the Taiwan Strait reached back in 1992. It was actually proposed by Taiwan and the former president, uh, Li Denghui, when, she, when he actually uh, made that decision in a plenary session of the National Unification Council. The mainland accepted that when China respected the invitation. But in the last seven years, I have also made it very clear, when we interpret one China, that one China to us is Republic of China. And we are determined not to promote the policy of two Chinas, the policy of one China, one Taiwan, and the policy of Taiwan independence. So these assurances have made a very important cornerstone of the status quo. So we will we welcome anyone in Taiwan to support the status quo. But the status quo is the status quo now, not seven years ago. If that can be done, I'm sure the peace and stability in the Taiwan Street will be maintained. Thank you. And President Ma, we're now going to turn to questions from the audience. And the first one is as follows. What steps is your government taking to decrease economic inequality and what still needs to be done? Okay, this is a very, very good uh, question, particularly in a country like Taiwan, which attaches a lot of importance to uh, the uh, equitable distribution of wealth. As you know, our founding father, Dr. Sen said, already advocate policy of equitable distribution of wealth. Uh, he has the uh, three principles of people, and the third one, Ming Sen Zhu Yi, is exactly that. So in the last 30 years, we have tried every possible way to make the distribution of income and wealth uh, more equitable than, than before. As of now, in terms of uh, income distribution in Taiwan, uh, if we use the so-called Oshima Index, which use the top 20% families and uh, bottom 20% families and see the uh, difference. During the financial tsunami, the difference is about 6.34 times. 6.34 times. And the, uh, last year, the figure went down to 6.08. We're talking about family disposable income. But if we use the personal income of individuals of that family, then it's 4.08 times. Of course, this may not completely show the whole picture. So we certainly still have a lot of room to improve. But compared to other countries in the region, I think we actually, in this, in this area, we actually have done better than Singapore, Hong Kong, and South Korea, the other uh, three Asian dragons. And we are going to do more through, first of all, the change of our tax system to let the rich uh, sort of have more uh, contribution in this regard. Another one is we will increase our social welfare because they are a, a number of people in the society who simply do not have any income. So the government has to help them. In the last seven years, my administration has uh, changed the social welfare picture to a very significant extent. For instance, for those under the poverty line, used to be uh, 260,000 people. But now we have lowered the, lower the standard and let more have the sub subsidies from the government. The number now is 700,000. So our social welfare expenditure has become number one compared to other subjects the government are using. So this is a national policy to continue to shorten the distance between the rich and the poor. We have made some progress, but certainly we have to do more. And uh, I think the, the, the method will continue to be, first of all, the change of the tax 
uh, structure, and then social welfare. So we are proposing a combined tax on land and housing uh, in the, the near future. We hope if we can get that passed, it certainly will contribute more to the uh, equitable distribution of wealth in Taiwan. This is a question that will be with us for uh, a long time, but we'll gradually, gradually change the current uh, difference and hope eventually we will be more equitable. Thank you. Another question from the audience. If mainland China becomes more democratic, do you think the Taiwanese people would be more likely to view cross-strait relations more positively or even support unification? It's a very good question, although it's a very hypothetical. Uh, so, uh, first of all, we certainly hope that in China could be uh, more democratic. We're not trying to import and impose a Western value on men in China. If we look at Chinese history, even in the time of spring and water periods, some of the uh, rulers are advised to tolerate dissent. They need to repeat, to tolerate dissent. And this is not a Western tradition. It, in Chinese, we call it zi chan hu wen xiang xiao. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a, a, a ruler who hid to his advisor's suggestion that let a forum open for the countrymen to criticize the government. This is something uh, something of a tradition for over 2,000 years. So that's one thing. If we can do that, if the man in China could do that, I'm sure the psychological distance between men in China and Taiwan will be greatly shortened. I cannot promise that people there will support the location, but at least, at least, the people on both sides of Taiwan's chain can then think on an equal basis. This is actually what I have uh, said every time uh, we see something that many China may do. Uh, I know, I understand their developmental strategy is different from ours. They spend the most of their energy on the economic side, and they have already created remarkable results after 30 years of a very fast development. But the people of many China there are more and more middle class emerging. They are more and more interested in participating in the decision of public affairs. So this is something that is also inevitable and irreversible. That is why every time I have a chance, I will advise the man as a friend, as someone who has experienced the democratization process in Taiwan, <coughs> that if men in China could do this, obviously there will be more People from China, they want to really uh, deal with the mainland. So this is a first step, a first step for a further integration between Taiwan and the mainland. Certainly, we hope that will be a rea reality in the future. Um, <coughs> President Ma, speaking for everyone in this room and for the other rooms tuned into this program, I want to thank you for this wonderful and inspiring session you've given us. And I'd also like to give you the opportunity to make some closing remarks. Okay. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before we conclude today's video conference, I would like to extend my sincere thanks again to Secretary Perry, to Professor Diamond, to Professor Dr. Fingar, to Ambassador Eichenberry, to Dr. Chen, and to the Stanford University Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, and to all the, the, the members in the audience. I deeply appreciate your efforts in organizing this important conference on the 70th anniversary of Republic of China's victory in the resistance war against Japan, as well as your generosity in sharing with me your views on the prospect of the future of East Asia. I would additionally like to commend your audience and distinguished guests for their enthusiastic participation, insightful views, and challenging questions. 
I have, it has been an honor to exchange views with such distinguished participants. Last but not least, let us salute to all those who endured, suffered, and sacrificed to achieve peace and victory 70 years ago, and forge a friendship that endures to this day. Thank you very, very much. Well, I want to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank uh, the President of the Republic of China, Taiwan, one last time, President Ma Ying Zhou, for those eloquent and very spirited remarks. And Mr. President, I don't know how you remember all those facts and figures, but you'd be a very successful politician in the United States. And I want to thank uh, our panelists, uh, former Secretary of Defense uh, and beloved professor at Stanford, Bill Perry, uh, Professor Tom Finger, Ambassador Carl Eikenberry, and Dr. Lan He Chen. Thank you all so much. One last thing, we've received many, many questions, Mr. President, many more than we could uh, distill and pose to you here. Uh, with your permission and with the cooperation of Ambassador Shen, and if anyone else has them, we will gather them all up and convey them to you, at least so you know what people were asking you here. Thank you all so much. Uh, Larry, uh, Larry. Yes. Uh, please, please, uh, give us, give us all the questions you have received. We will try to answer that one by one. Not today. Okay. <laughs> all right. We will do that. I promise. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, audience. Thank you. So if anyone else has a question that you'd like uh, to have conveyed to President Ma, please give it to me uh, before you leave the room. And we will now have a reception. Uh, please join us if you.